I'm an independent journalist and a visiting faculty at the Cotelia School of Public Policy. And I have with me here somebody who's brought global laurels for India. His music, which has claimed new heights, international critical acclaim. He's truly a global music composer, an environmentalist at heart, something that he works for. His cause is for the environment. He's a music producer who has brought home the Grammy Awards not once, not twice, but thrice. Let's welcome Ricky Cage. Can I please request Mr. Jay Shankar Bariyar, the Pro VC for Academics, to please come and quickly felicitate Ricky before we start the conversation. So this way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, thank you for helping me out. So this year, Ricky Cage won his third Grammy for the album Divine Tides. Uh, this actually won in the best new age album category. And the album beat heavyweights like Christina Aguilera, as well as the chain smokers. There. <laughs> Now, uh, you know, your second Grammy was for the best New Age album, which, and in 2015, when you won your first Grammy for Winds of Samsara, you actually became the youngest Indian to receive in a Grammy award. So you've, today, you know, uh, the, the feat that has been achieved by the likes of the late Pandit Ravi Shankar, you have achieved three Grammys. Ricky, so glad to have you here. Tell us to begin with, how does it feel to hold that Grammy in your hands, really? <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you so much for having me amongst you. It's a huge honor for me to present myself in front of you. Thank you so much. Now, of course, growing up, uh, growing up in India, especially growing up in Bangalore, making independent music, making music from the heart, it always felt like it was an absolutely unattainable dream to actually win the Grammy Award because there was no, not even a thought that this was even possible. I would watch the Grammys on television. I would, uh, you know, admire all the stars who would go up on stage and, you know, and win a Grammy Award. And there was never even a thought that would even cross my mind that this would be possible for me or anybody in my generation to actually win. Uh, but then at the age of 33 in 2015, I actually won that Grammy Award and it was an absolutely surreal experience to go up on stage, to even be amongst all these artists that I've admired all my life from all over the world, and then to go up on stage, collect the trophy, to give my acceptance speech, and the trophy is pretty heavy though, <laughs> and uh, and to actually, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, no, there's no way to describe it be, uh, besides it being an absolutely surreal experience, and especially the kind of music that I do, uh, you know, which is uh, which is not mainstream Bollywood or film music. It's it's music from the heart. So to be rewarded for that, uh, for music that is not mainstream, music that I create from the heart, music that is based on my own sensibilities, my own philosophies, rather than what a director tells me to do, uh, it, it felt good to be rewarded for all of that, and it, ensu it ensured that I could continue on that path of making music from the heart for the rest of my life. You know, now that it has become a habit for you to keep winning the Grammys, next time you'll be like, chalo, stage pe chalte hain. It's, <laughs> it's coming my it way It was similar again. this time, actually, <laughs> because the first two times that I won, I gave a nice acceptance speech. This time, if you watch, uh, if you watch my acceptance speech, I just went up on stage and said, namaste and thank you, and I walked <laughs> off. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, Ricky was also actually chosen as the face of the Earth Hour earlier in March this year by the Wildlife, by the World Wildlife Fund, deservedly so for all the work that he has been doing on climate conservation, on sustainable environment. But I think your true my I have arrived moment happened when you saw your 
Amul Doodle. <laughs> Can we pull that up, please, on stage? The Amul Doodle for Ricky Cage. What, what was the reaction when you actually saw that you were suddenly plastered across the ads there? No, of course, uh, uh, everybody knows the Amul cartoons that, uh, that that particular strip that comes out. It's one of the longest running strips. I think in the whole world it said that, you know, it's, it's gotten a Guinness Book of World Record for being the longest running comic strip. There you are. So... <laughs> Cage is the rage. <laughs> it's like... And it's called the Grammy Snacks for Garma. <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, I mean, how did it make you feel that you, you, there on this ad that we've grown up looking at? No, of course, it was, it was quite amazing. It, uh, it came as a complete surprise, actually, when uh, I just opened up my, you know, my social media that particular morning and I saw that Amul has done this particular thing. Then I thought maybe it must be fan-made. Maybe a fan of mine has actually made it. But then later on, I saw it on the Amul handle itself. And it was nice because Amul... That particular, uh, that particular strip that Amul does, this comic strip, uh, if you look at it, it's actually journalism, right? Yeah. Because, uh, because they've chronicled the history of our country for so many decades through that particular comic strip. So to be a part of that history and part of that legacy of our country through this particular comic strip, it just felt nice. Yeah. Uh, Ricky, you were born in North Carolina in the US and you moved to Bangalore with your family when I think you were six years old? Uh, six years old. Six correct. years old. So your parents are doctors. Was it a quintessential family upbringing where they wanted you to take two medicines when both your parents are doctors? And <laughs> for those of you who do not know, how many students do we have here from college of, the dental college, any students? Okay, we don't have, but medical, medical students? One. One, one <laughs> hand. Ricky is actually a qualified dentist. So that was supposed to be the career path you, your parents wanted you to take? No, that, that was not the career path they wanted me to take. So the thing is that um, ever since I remember, I've always been two things. I've been a musician and I've been an environmentalist. You know, two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and all of my life decisions. And as you correctly mentioned, I grew up in America. So I grew up in this very small town in North Carolina called Roanoke Rapids, middle of nowhere. And we used to have a whole lot of forest areas around our home. And we used to have a lot of creepy crawly animals that would enter my home on a regular <laughs> basis, like snakes and lizards and reptiles and, you know, and animals that you are normally supposed to be afraid of. And my parents and my teachers used to constantly tell me that, you know, that as soon as you see these animals, you're supposed to step on them and kill them or you're supposed to run away from them. And my question to them always was that, if you're supposed to kill them the minute we see them, then why do they exist on this planet? You know, they obviously have some sort of purpose if they are on this planet. And that was the environmentalist in me. And of course, now I realize that every single species of animal, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is a really important part of the ecosystem. And it's this delicate balance of the ecosystem that keeps all of us alive as human beings. And it's absolutely essential for us to protect, preserve, and sustain our natural world so that we ourselves can survive as human beings. So these are the questions that would keep me awake at night. And throughout my life, uh, throughout my schooling, and even during my... 11th and 12th, uh, I was very obsessed with music and music was a very, very important part of my life. In fact, my life depended on my music because that was all that I would do. And my parents knew really well that this guy is going to become a professional musician because that's all that he can think about. But my parents are Indian parents. <laughs> <laughs> so so my, uh, my father was furious and he said that, no, you have to have some sort of a degree or an engineering degree or a dental degree or a medical degree. So after a lot of fighting with my parents, I reached a compromise with them that I would finish off a degree in dental surgery. And once I finish off that degree, my life is my own and they would never question me again uh, for the rest of my life. So that's exactly what I did. I went to five years of college, uh, dental college. My musical career had already started by then and I was already making a good living from my music. So in the evenings, I would be doing music. In the daytime, I would be in the dental college. So. Let's say from 9 to 5, I was in dental college. From 5 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning, I was in some studio recording music and creating music. So I was working really, really hard during those days. And then at the end of five years, I'm sorry to say, but I did not know anything about dentistry, but I got a degree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is what happened. And I went straight to my father when I got the degree certificate. I gave it to him and I told him that this is for you. 
Dentistry is a very noble profession and it's an extremely essential profession. But it is not for me because I want to be a musician. So that is what uh, started off my full-time musical career. But, you know, before we move on to the next thing, I just wanted to throw it out to you guys that, you know, my father, I do not blame him for me wasting five years of my life doing a degree that I would never use eventually. Uh, and because he was basing all his decisions on fear. You know, fear of me starving to death, fear of me not being successful, fear of what he would tell his relatives as to what I do for a living, <laughs> you know. So basically these are the fears that our parents have and for me everything was based on passion. But imagine if I was fearful and after finishing off that degree in dental surgery, I decided that let me, you know, let me have a 9 to 5 job, let me start off a clinic, let me treat patients from 9 to 5 and what would I be doing, you know, I would go to my clinic at 9 o'clock, I would be treating patients, doing all these extractions and all of that stuff and all that I would be thinking about while I'm doing these procedures on my patient is, is when can I go back home and uh, play on my guitar or play on my keyboard or make some music. <laughs> I would be a very frustrated professional. In such kind of a scenario, would any of you like to come to me for a tooth extraction? <laughs> It could be a musical one, why are you extracting this music in your head? <laughs> so basically nobody would ever want to get a surgical procedure done by a person who is a frustrated dentist. So, so that is what, so basically I decided that I'm not even going to practice even for a single day and I decided to get into music full time and as they say there was no looking back after that. <laughs> we are so glad, otherwise you know he is the only Indian living right now with a hat trick of Grammys. I mean we have a lot of dentists but we really do not have a hat trick in Grammys among us. So we are so no. glad that you actually chose this career instead. No, but, but let me point out that every single dentist is extremely important. Absolutely. So that is one thing and second thing is that it, it, it may sound funny, it may sound cool to talk about that you know I did this degree in dental surgery and then I became a musician. But actually speaking, it was extremely irresponsible. Because if you think about it, there was that one person who probably wanted to be a dentist and would have probably been a good dentist and I stole that person's seat. And that, that one professional, that one uh, professional dentist is missing from our country. So I believe that, you know, that uh, I do not believe that I did a good thing. But nevertheless, you know, that's what it is and, uh, you know, and I, and I hope I can be forgiven for I, that. I think you, of course, you know, <laughs> we, we have to find that courage to start our negotiations early on in our career with our parents. Uh, how many of you are music lovers here in the room? <laughs> okay, the, the one or two people who do not love music, I'll have a conversation with you later on. No, I think they also <laughs> love music, they're taking photographs. They're taking <laughs> and how many of you actually want to pursue music but are not being able to do so? Okay, couple of hands going up slowly. <laughs> I, I'm hoping that you're able to have that conversation and do that negotiation with your parents. But uh, Ricky, I mean, what was your earliest inspiration into music like? Did you, was there somebody in the family who was trained in music? When did you start your training? Where did you go for your training? So I started off as being a self-taught musician. So as I mentioned that I grew up in Roanoke Rapids for the first six years of my life. My father had this massive, massive music collection. During those days it was LPs and cassette tapes, none of you will know what that is. Anybody but seen a cassette tape here in the room? <laughs> <laughs> the Only the front row. <laughs> Only the front row, okay, some of the young ones. <laughs> so, basically, so basically he had this massive collection of, uh, of, uh, of records, of LPs, of 8-track cartridges, of uh, uh, cassette tapes. And this was music not just of the current pop hits, like you know during those days it was Michael Jackson and the Bee Gees and Madonna and artists like that. But uh, my father also had a lot of obscure music from different parts of the world. Like you know music from South Africa, music from Senegal, music from Europe, Celtic music, music from Southeast Asia, from Japan, from Korea. So I would listen to this music all day long. So for all my classmates and my older brother, you know, they were obsessed with television by watching cartoons, playing video games and things like that. For me the center of my universe was always my music system. So I would listen to music all day long. I would try to understand what are the different musicians trying to, uh, trying to speak through their music, what are the different instruments used, what are the different cultures and that is what was most of my music education. My father also had a guitar at home, he also had a baby piano at home, a really tiny piano at home. Maybe at some point he wanted to learn music but there is no musician in my family besides me. So, uh, so I would play on these musical instruments, I learned on my own but later on in my life 
when I got into my 11th and 12th, that is when I decided that if I have to make this my profession, I have to treat it with the same respect that you would treat a traditional career path like engineering or medicine or whatever. So then that is when I decided that it is really important for me to get a formal education in music. And mind you, till right up until then in my school, I was already winning a whole lot of international awards and national awards when it came to music. But even then I felt that I need to have a formal education in music because when it comes to the arts, arts is all about breaking the rules. Am I right? So arts is all about breaking the rules, pushing the boundary of the art. But you have to know the rules in order to break them. So, and you have to know how to communicate with other musicians. And, if you, and the only way you can learn how to communicate with other musicians is if you learn the language of music and if you learn music in a formal way. So that is when, at the age of, I think, 16 or 17, I, I started learning music formally, trying to unlearn all the stuff that I learned on my own and trying to learn it more formally so that I would, uh, I would probably sidestep a perceived handicap that I would have later on in my life. And I would encourage everybody, if you want to have a career in the arts, it is extremely important for you to learn what people in the past have done. And then later on, you can disregard everything, but learn what everybody in the past has done because that is exactly what a music education in the arts is. But why did you choose to focus on a very niche sort of a music area, Ricky? You know, when obviously you have way more perks, a lot more popularity when you're going with hip hop, reggae, Bollywood style of music. I mean, your music people, somebody would say it's ambient music, somebody would say it's soul music. How do you define your own music and what made you take to this particular kind of music? Uh, do you think the appeal has increased pan India now compared to the Western sort of fans that you have for your music? Sure, so I can answer that question now. Um, music is an art. Am I right? There is no doubt about that. Okay, now if you look at an artist, like let's say Vincent Van Gogh, one of the most famous artists of our contemporary times. Vincent Van Gogh, if he was making a new painting, he would not go to all the neighboring art galleries and see what is everybody doing, let me do something similar. Would he do that? He would dig deep into his soul, deep, dig deep into his heart, he would try to figure out what is it that he wants to communicate through his art, and then he would communicate that through his art. And if I wanted to know what kind of a person Vincent van Gogh was, I'm not going to read a book about him. I'm going to look at all his paintings, and I'm going to see that, okay, this person was a tormented individual. He had sort of like a psychedelic mindset and things like that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to judge that person by their art. But in India, every single musician makes only two kinds of songs, love songs and item songs. That's all. And that is because the film industry, whether it's Bollywood industry or the other industries, they have got such a tight grip on music that when I tell people that I'm a composer, the first question I'm asked is, which film have you composed music for? You know, because there is such a tight grip when it comes to the music industry. Now I'll explain about breaking cultural barriers. Now all these amazing Bollywood and other industry singers and artists and composers, they perform all over the world, right? They perform in places like New York, San Francisco, San Diego, Melbourne, Moscow. Coachella. They perform, uh, Coachella, they perform <laughs> everywhere. Now the thing is that they perform everywhere and they manage to fill up stadiums, they manage to fill up complete auditoriums without a problem. Huge crowds come to their concerts. But who is there in the audience? It is only the Indian diaspora. Hmm. Nobody else shows up for these concerts. It is only the Indian diaspora that shows up for these concerts. Whereas, when I was 19 years old, I had gone to San Francisco and I watched a concert of Pandit Ravi Shankar, the great sitar player, you know, the amazing sitar player, greatest ever in the history, Bharat Ratna winner, all of that stuff. So basically, I went and watched his concert and I was shocked that the demographic of people inside the auditorium was exactly representative of the demographic of, the demogra sorry, demographic of people within the city. Like, for example, the city had an 80% Caucasian population 80% Caucasian population in the theater, 5% Asian population, 5% Asian population in the theater. And I sat up and I watched this great man and I was like, wow, this guy has broken cultural barriers so much so that people who are normally not exposed to Indian music are listening to Indian music. And that's the case with all the classical musicians, whether it is Ustad Zakir Hussain, uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Pandit Bhimsen Joshi, uh, Pandit Vishwamohan Bhatt, Ustad Alaraka Khan, all of them basically, they have broken, so they are the actual flag bearers of Indian traditions and culture all over the world. Because what is, what is film music? Film music is basically Western pop music with Indian lyrics. 
whereas the actual indian traditional music is basically our our classical musicians and our folk musicians and that is when i decided that i want to break cultural barriers let's and the other thing is that let's say i'll give you an example of like you know a very close friend of mine vishal dadlani from uh, vishal shekar very close friend of mine great musician makes great music did pathan all of that stuff now vishal is a person who is heavily into gender equality he is constantly talking about gender equality constantly talking about making this world a better place and he is a good human being but his most famous song till date is a song called sheela ki jawani and he has written the lyrics for that song and that song is as misogynistic as it can yeah, get true. it is itemizing women it is objectifying women so now we understand that vishal has been paid to make the song that's why he's made it as a job but you can you imagine vishal himself sitting down at home and listening to that song absolutely not so why are people making songs that are not their personality at all so that is why we need to encourage a whole new generation of artists who are making music and making art which is representative of who they are and it is communicating what they want to say what they want to communicate of their own philosophies their own beliefs rather than saying something that they are not at all you know coming to personality styles and i will open up the floor for questions in the next 5 7 minutes itself the bbc in an article wrote about ricky sharply dressed and sporting a salt pepper beard <laughs> with slick long hair which i think has I been shortened <laughs> since then Kej has an air of glamour around him. People who are familiar with him says he loves to party, and Kej agrees he does. What level of party animal are we talking about here? So I can tell you this: I love hanging around with friends. For me, this is the party that I'm sitting down over here, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, but one thing I can tell you is that I have never sipped alcohol in my life. I don't even know what it tastes like. I've never tried a single puff of a cigarette ever in my life never done any drugs because people feel that you know that being a musician you need to do all of these things and you need to be on a different plane that's all nonsense because nowadays there's so much of technology used in music that you need to have a very clear mind while you're making art you, you need to have a extremely clear mind and previously there used to be an ecosystem like you know for example if i'm a musician all that i need to care about is making the music making like one album every two years and there's somebody else to market it there's somebody else to you know to popularize it somebody else to make videos for it and all that you need to do is just sit down and make a few songs that does not exist anymore now being a musician you have to be multiple things you have to be a leader you have to be an entrepreneur you have to be a leader because you're working with large teams and you need to have these leadership abilities you need to convince people that you're doing a good job and you're making good music and you need to be an entrepreneur because you're constantly selling something being a musician and what you're selling you're selling yourself constantly so you need to be an entrepreneur and all of these things can only happen if you've got a clear mind you're extremely hard working and you're working towards your goal rather than just having fun but has increasing technology reduced the quality of music do you see chat gpt composing lyrics in future <laughs> i would say the most important thing when it comes to music is eliciting an emotional response from your audience whether it is chat gpt doing it or whether it is ai doing it or whether it's a human being doing it the cause of music should be served that is the most important thing so at the end of the day the music has to be excellent it does not matter whether it is through technology or through human intervention you know so let's let's actually play out something composed by ricky kej at this point in time and then ricky can take us through the journey of that song and then i'll be happy to come over to the audience for can context word yes love, love we are divine. playing out shanti samsara first uh, no uh, love divine oh, love divine okay love divine so i'm just going to give you context to this quickly so i just need your attention for this now all of you all remember that in kerala this was in 2020 do you all remember that there was this very powerful image of this free, female pregnant elephant who was in the middle of a water body in middle of a lake and she had died in the middle of the lake everybody remember that so to give you a quick context to that now this female elephant female pregnant elephant she wandered out of the forest looking for food and then she wandered into a farmland and when she wandered into the farmland she ate a pineapple little did she know that the pineapple was laden with explosives she ate those explosives explosives damaged her mouth fatally she wobbled away all the way to a water body she stood in the water body and while standing she basically passed away now there was a huge reaction all over the world every single newspaper whether it's bbc cnn new york times la times 
everybody pose, everybody you know printed that picture of that very powerful image of that elephant and of course everybody said that the farmer should be hung upside down the farmer should be killed the farmer should be beheaded farmer should go to jail for life and it's true the farmer needs to be punished and absolutely needs to be punished but we city people all of us sitting over here need to look inwards we need to look inwards because if we do not have electricity for 2 minutes we are so inconvenienced if there is a new gadget that comes out a new iphone or something that comes out and they and it goes out of stock we're like why can't they make more of this where is all that coal coming from for all our electricity it's coming from digging up those forests where is all this nickel cadmium lithium silica iron ore magnesium for making our phones coming from they're coming from digging up those forests so it's our consumption patterns and our greed that is digging up those forests destroying the habitats of those elephants the elephants have no other choice but to walk out of the forest to get food and then they go into that farmland and the farmer i mean that has no other choice but to protect his or her livelihoods and lives itself of his or her children and that is why they put these explosives in the fruits which should be punished but what i'm saying is that we have to look inwards we have to see that our consumption patterns is what is causing all of these problems i also wanted to ask you because uh, when it comes to environmental consciousness i mean you said from a very young age you had that how many students here would actually call yourselves environmentally conscious give me an honest reply two three students okay the others are honest enough even something as basic as taking care of nature cleanliness not littering through plastic how do you build that consciousness among the youth so what i've tried to do in my life is that i've tried not to be very preachy because if you are preachy among a crowd of people you end up being coming the villain in the whole process so what uh, what I, i what i can do is that i can tell you what i do in my life okay so what i do in my life is that there are few things that i do one thing is that i do not subscribe to fast fashion fast fashion is one of the most polluting industries on our planet and in fact uh, it it's it's got the highest carbon footprint on our planet when it comes to fast fashion so like uh, in uh, in february this year when i won my grammy award i wore this cream colored sherwani and uh, since that time when i wore it uh, at that particular award ceremony i've worn that same cream sherwani now for 14 concerts and tomorrow and day after i'm going to be wearing it for another two concerts Last year when I won my Grammy I I wore a blue sherwani and I worn that for over 40 concerts and finally I had to retire it because it tore. So at any given point of time and this may seem difficult but it's not at any given point of time I only have 11 sets of clothes. I buy good quality clothes and I ensure that they last and I take good care of my clothes and then once they tear that is when I give them up. So at any given point of time I only have 11 sets of clothes. This uh, suit that I'm wearing right now go on to my Instagram you'll see it on at least 10 or different 10 or 15 different occasions that i worn this exact same suit now the second thing that i do is that i'm a vegetarian but this is a path that everybody has to take themselves because there is a huge cultural significance and a health significance but the meat industry is a polluting industry so basically one has to figure out what can you do within your own lives to reduce your consumption when it comes to meat and indian diets itself are quite conducive to this indian diets have even the meat people who eat meat within when it comes to indian diets eat very less meat it's not like how it is in the west so that way it's all right the third thing that i do is that i do not own a car i do not own a car i use only public transportation because i realize that when i travel around the world because i realize that when i travel around the world i use public transportation in every city so then i realize that why can't i do that in my own country and my own city so then that is when i decided to use BMTC buses in Bangalore and I use the metro in Bangalore and when I need to I use taxis but I use public transportation and lastly just like how everybody get their finances audited every quarter I get my carbon footprint audited with a firm in Bangalore so my carbon footprint is audited every quarter everything from my ink usage to my uh, to my flight travel to my ground transportation to my concert usage lighting usage everything is audited and then i have a meeting with this firm to figure out how i can bring down my carbon footprint for the next quarter and then i mitigate my carbon footprint by investing in renewable energy companies and doing tree plantation so these are the four things that i do and they are very simple things i think it's a very very conscious attempt in trying to do that let's open up the floor for the students can i have some show of hands of anybody with a question come on 
guys raise your hands please we have mics here okay we have somebody here with a question can can we get a mic quickly please walk quickly <laughs> satya hello and very good afternoon sir uh, well we'll, we'll stop yeah well i have been following grammy and black music awards since 2010 and 11 Uh, so basically at that time i'm basically i like r&b and hip hop that time there used to be like a separate black music or what you say uh, the use of n word what you see the use of uh, drug culture what you see in hip hop over the years what i have realized ki if a song is released be it in a pop or a solo it has explicit version and as independently and the general version so as a musician and a composer what do you think when a collaboration from a big artist come do you care about the ethics more or do you care about the big hit do you care about the ethics more or do you care about hitting the chart board like being in the billboards or something see for me it is different because my music is not a mainstream form of music you know and for me you can sit down so for me it's not a mainstream form of music and for me it's not a one size fits all approach because what happens when it comes to mainstream music and when you're making film music or you're making mainstream pop music you're trying to reach a wide as wide demographic as possible you know you're trying to reach as many white people as possible of different age groups and different cultures and different communities and things like that so uh, i cannot sit and complain that my music is not listened to as widely as these hip hop people and all of that stuff because i'm making music from the heart and i'm making music that i love listening to and i'm making music that i love so for me it's a different kind of a struggle rather than trying to look at how i can make music that everybody loves for me it is make music that i love and trying to find people who like that music so that is why so it is a niche uh, form of music and if you look at the classical musicians you look at the jazz musicians in america like people like chikoria and all of that uh, the difference between them and the pop musicians is that when it comes to a taylor swift or when it comes to like a jay z or whatever they are the flavor of the month you know that uh, the people love their music their music goes on the charts and then after that if they do not deliver something that they like then they are forgotten immediately and there's so many artists who have been forgotten there's so many artists who are one hit wonders where they've just made one album which was a hit and after that people have forgotten them same thing with the movie industry whereas when you are in a niche genre and you're making music from the heart you have a smaller audience but at the same time that audience remains loyal to you till the day you die they are constantly looking at what are you releasing what are you doing if you're doing a concert we want to come and watch that concert so for me i would and i mentioned about the whole item song thing that i would never like to do and things like that so i would rather be extremely i mean i, I would rather be uh, i would rather be sort of like uh, you know not that well known i would rather be have a niche audience rather than being extremely well known for something that does not define me at all Thank you, sir. Uh, one more small question, sir. For like aspiring musician, what software would you prefer, or would you suggest? Is it FL Studio or any other new software? No, no. Software that is something prefer? that is your preference, basically, because that is always a thing. Like uh, every musician has got their software, and uh, for me, it is Cubase. Cubase is what I use for everything. But every musician has got their own preference, and it depends upon your own uh, preferences. You know. So I've seen people who use different kinds of softwares, and they are equally good at that. So. Thank you so much, yeah. and all the best for your upcoming album. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Do we, do we have a second question here right now? Yeah, pass the mic, please, sir. And then I'm told that we have queued the song, so we'll play it after this answer. Uh, uh, hi, sir. Uh, so I was wondering. Um, a lot of people have different ways to create art, right? So I was wondering what your if you have a process uh, like that, or is that or is, or is it that inspiration comes to you and then you are inspired to make art, or do you have a disciplined process that you follow? So there are always two ways to create art. One is basically when somebody pays you money and commissions art from you, you know? Like for example, the film industry or doing advertising jingles and things like that. So somebody pays you, gives you a brief and tells you that you have to do it this way. That is where you have deadlines. That is where you have to think from somebody else's point of view. You have to think either from your audience's point of view or you have to think from your director's point of view. And that is where things like creative block happens and you know and uh, you know and you're not able to deliver on time you're very stressed about it and things like that so that is one way of creating music where your in, your inspiration is basically the money or your inspiration is basically fame and things like that then the way that i create music is basically as an art form so so for me it is more like since i create music on the environment and on positive social impact i just mentioned the elephant story to you so this story inspires me you know it inspires me that wow this has really affected me the story of this female pregnant elephant has really affected me 
and I want to communicate what I felt about this elephant to the whole world. So then it becomes a struggle of communicating all these thoughts and ideas that I have through the language of music and through visuals such that the end listener, when they listen to it, they feel the exact same emotion that I'm feeling. So I explained the elephant story, so hopefully when you watch the video, you will, uh, let's see if you feel that same feeling that I felt when I uh, got that. But uh, Ricky, you know, I would also like to ask you, because you've had close interactions with Prime Minister Modi. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to India's climate action goals, the talk about climate justice, is there any area where you think that we are still not focusing on, that we need to sort of focus on? And how have your interactions been with the Prime Minister on the issue of climate and environment? So it's been uh, by and large good because the first time when I met Prime Minister Modi, he was visiting the climate change conference in Paris. That is in 2015, in November. And uh, so there are a few ambitious goals that our, uh, our, uh, uh, our Prime Minister has got. One is, of course, the Solar Alliance. Uh, I think you all should read up about the Solar Alliance. It's a very, very ambitious goal between India and France in, uh, mainly, but it's involving tropical nations from across the world. So basically, it's, a, it's, an, al it's an alignment of tropical nations from all over the world. I've forgotten the number of countries. It's maybe about 60 or 80 countries, which have got a tropical climate, got good sunlight. And it's about creating a whole lot of solar energy, which will, uh, which will benefit the entire planet. And it will reduce our dependence on fossil fuel energy. Second thing is that what I can talk to you about right now is basically the new mission that the government of India has got. It's called as the Life Mission. Uh, so I would strongly urge everybody to read that. It is L-I-F-E, which is a capital L, small i, capital F, and capital E. It stands for Lifestyle for Environment. So as the name suggests, it's all about, uh, it's, it's all about you know, that everybody in this world uh, you know, the, the biggest threat to us, uh, I mean, that we've got all these problems like climate change, species extinction, deforestation, uh, air pollution, uh, you know, uh, plastics pollution. But the biggest threat to us as a species is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference. You know, we always talk about changing the world, but we rarely talk about changing ourselves. And that is what this mission is all about. It's all about empowering ourselves to believe that the small, tiny, incremental changes that we make within our own lives can actually make a difference. Because right now we are like, if, we, if I stop using single-use plastics, what difference will it make? Or if I'm kind to people, what difference will it make? Or if I use public transportation, what difference will it make? But that is all that matters. All that matters is for us to change our own behaviors and to be the change that we want to see, as they say. So that is what the life mission is about, about not buying everything that is in front of you, buying everything with a lot of intention, you know, not wasting stuff, uh, you know, and, uh, and practicing a, a circular economy where you are trying to reuse everything that you purchase. So basically, don't refuse anything that you cannot reuse. That is the mantra that everybody should have. Buy only things that you can reuse and reuse for a very long time. This whole use and throw idea should be completely away. Because if you look at plastics itself, plastics was invented as a miracle material because it was non-biodegradable. Okay, but we human beings, for some reason, we call a non-biodegradable material disposable. It does not make any sense, right? How can a non-biodegradable material be called disposable? So that's what we need to do. We need to practice, uh, we need to bring in environmentalism within our own lives, within our own tiny capacity, and stop worrying about changing the world. We just need to change ourselves. What, what you want versus what you need is, I think, what sort of needs to underline. How many of you are happy shoppers? Online shoppers, happy to shop every click of the bit. So am I. Even yeah. me, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the others are not. So I'm hoping that you're true to that. But, you know, Ricky, taking forward the question of somebody here saying that when you collaborate with artists, do you look at their ethics? Do you look at... You've been on the US Billboard chart at number one. And you've collaborated with a lot of international artists, uh, uh, you know, with Stuart Copeland of The Police. You've had work, you worked with Bruno Mars, with Baba Mal. Uh, how challenging are collaborations when it comes to international uh, you know, musicians that you're working with? So when it comes to collaborations, uh, what needs to happen is that there needs to be a mutual respect between both the artists. Uh, so what has happened in the past is that when anybody wants to bring in an Indian collaborator or a Western musician wants to bring in a little bit of flavoring of Indian music, it's usually one sitar piece in between or it is a little bit of tabla here and there to bring in that Indian flavor. It's almost like bringing in an Indian spice 
in a, in a pasta dish or something like that, you know. So what needs to happen is that it needs to be a 50-50% collaboration, a collaboration of hearts, a collaboration of minds, and a true respectful collaboration of traditions. So what I do when I collaborate is that I, uh, there is a lot of compromise. Because sometimes I feel that, uh, that, you know, that I'm completely right in a certain aspect. Like I'll give you an example. For my last album, I collaborated with Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland being the drummer of the police, sold 75 million copies of his albums, one of the greatest legends of all time. So I had made a very strong decision that when I collaborate with Stuart Copeland, whatever he asks me to do, I will do. You know, if he tell, even if it goes against my thoughts and my philosophy, if he tells me that remove this flute from here, I will remove it. If he tells me that change this particular piece of music and change these notes, I will do it. And what I will do is that even if I feel that it is not right what he's asking me to do, I will still live with that for two weeks. I will, I will make the change. I will live with that for two weeks. And after two weeks, if I still feel that what Stuart Copeland asked me to do was wrong, then I will tell him that, you know, maybe what you suggested is not the right way to go about it. And surprisingly, this happened many times during our collaboration on Divine Tides. And every single time, after two weeks, when I would revisit the song, I would thank God that I listened to Stuart Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> Listening is good. Uh, you know, we just have the last couple of minutes. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. I'm happy to, in fact, uh, carry on. Yeah, there. I can see your hand there. Quickly, the mic there. And then this young girl here. I think everybody's young, yeah? Uh, hello, hello. Yeah, yes. thank you. Okay. Uh, hi. So, uh, I would like to, uh, when you told us about the plastics and uh, how disposable plastics and how we have to reduce it, but uh, could you give us some alternatives to it? Because Correct. without alternatives, we can't change the system. Uh, that's one part of the question. Another part of the question, you said that uh, music, uh, uh, there's a lot of regulation when it comes to music, when it comes to movies and television screens. But sometimes, uh, isn't it uh, necessary, like for example, if there is a movie scene going on where there's a funeral scene, and for some reason, uh, you, you know, some artist feels that there should be a love music to it. So I don't think it is right. So what is your opinion on it? Thank you. Um, so when it comes to plastics, that was, in fact, a fantastic question. And just to expand on your question, it's not just about uh, finding alternatives. It's also about convenience. And it's also about economics. Because sometimes the alternatives exist, but it's not within our reach. Or sometimes the alternatives exist, and it's within our reach but the cost is too high and uh, you know and you cannot afford it so basically all these things need to come together to actually bring about change so like for example over here the simple alternatives is that right over here there is there's a glass bottle over here which i think it deserves a round of applause over here <laughs> because it would have been very simple to just put in a couple of plastic bottles over here you know but you one needs to make a statement because it's also happening on a stage you know so photographs are going to be taken and things like that. So one needs to make a statement over here that glass bottles are being used. But nevertheless, um, I believe that, yes, whatever is within your reach, you need to do that. And it's very important in terms of environmentalism, at least I believe, that one should not be too hard on yourself. You know, sometimes you need to use a plastic bottle. You, you know, so you, you need to buy it, you know. So, so, so it's very important to treat yourself with respect and treat yourself not with too much of harshness. If sometimes you need to go against the environment because alternatives do not exist or because it will affect you financially, then go ahead and do that. But at the same time, one must make a very concentrated effort to go in the right direction. That is very important. So do not be hard on yourself. Like, for example, when it comes to environmentalism, I'll quickly tell you, there are two ways to advocate about for the environment. One is shaming people into action, okay? And the second is inspiring people into action. Now, shaming people into action is very effective in its own way, but that's not the path that I've taken. And that's what I call the Greta Thunberg approach. You know, Greta Thunberg shames people into action, you know? She shames world leaders into action, and it's very effective. But sometimes it does not have a long-term effect, you know? And whereas inspiring people into action is what I would call the David Attenborough approach. Uh, everybody knows who David Attenborough is? I really wish yeah, the great naturalist and, uh, you know, and he's made so many of these movies. So he shows what is beautiful in this world. And he hopes that through that, through showcasing that beauty and get everyone to fall in love with the natural world. And hopefully through that love of the natural world, we will find it within ourselves to protect, to conserve and to sustain. So that is the path that I've taken. You know, try to make everyone fall in love with the natural world and hopefully, you know, because at the end of the day, we as human beings only protect things that we love. We only love things that we understand 
and we only understand things that we are taught. So we should all make it our mission to make everyone fall in love with the natural world and hopefully through that love everybody will protect, conserve and sustain because love is a far more practical approach towards getting things done. Right. Um, I'll, I'll just take and a final question. What did, he had a second question. What was that? I forgot. Shout it out. On regulations, on media, he said, regulations on films and regulations, whether it's important or not. Uh, okay, that is more of a, because I'm not in the industry, so yeah. I would not like to comment on that. Right. Let's just take a last question here, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Shravya. So I wanted to know the best uh, institutes in India where you can pursue music. <laughs> I have Indian parents too, so I can't. <laughs> Actually, we were just having a discussion on this, uh, you know, upstairs in the Vice Chancellor's office. So, yeah, there are, uh, maybe we can meet offline and I can figure out what exactly are your interests and, you know, and then I can give you a couple of suggestions. But there are interests, uh, I mean, there, there are uh, institutes in India and there are more and more coming up. I think uh, even, uh, even your own university has got a thriving, uh, you know, uh, music, uh, what do you call that, uh, music faculty. But I guess, yeah, there are, there are multiple ways to actually learn music in a more formal way. But it depends exactly on what you want to go for. And also, what do you want to showcase to your parents? Because parents always want to see infrastructure. Parents want to see a proper college that you're going to and all of that stuff. This is something that I can help you out so you can get in touch with me on social media. What or are you studying Shazam. currently? Uh, first year CSC core. CSC? B-Tech. B-Tech. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad that at least you're trying to not give up on your passion. Yeah. Just uh, to end the conversation with, I know you are a Bangalorean. Other than the Bangalore weather, what is it about Bangalore that is charming for you? That, uh, that you still think Bangalore has managed to retain? I think uh, Bangalore, uh, how many of you are from Bangalore? Anybody is from Bangalore over here? Bangaloreans, show your fan. Okay, four, five, six. Okay, few of you. Now, Bangalore, of course, has uh, changed by leaps and bounds, like, you know, over the last, uh, over the last uh, uh, you know, 33 years, the 35 years that I've been in Bangalore. It's, it's changed quite a lot. But I guess, uh, uh, Bangalore is home, I guess. That's the only thing that I can say, you know, whether it's good or bad, Bangalore is home. I always say this that, you know, because I travel so much around the world and I'm constantly traveling, living out of a suitcase. In fact, uh, in a month, I spend maybe about four or five days at home in Bangalore. But Bangalore will always be my home because Bangalore is where my dogs are. You know, <laughs> oh, that, because, <laughs> because you can travel with family everywhere. You can travel with human beings everywhere. But I believe that where your dogs are, that is where your home is. So that is where Bangalore will always be my home. <laughs> are, are you into politics at all, Ricky? I mean, I, I love getting to know more about politics and understanding about politics because of the environmentalism that I do and because of my role with the United Nations. As some of you may know that I'm the, uh, I'm the global goodwill ambassador for the United Nations. So I constantly travel, uh, not only for doing concerts for the United Nations, but also help them out with the negotiations with world leaders. and. You know, and I represent our country, represent other nations also, try to get work done, try to get treaties signed. So I do all of that. So I'm always interested in politics, but I will never, ever get into electoral politics in my life at all because the thing is that for me, it's very important as an individual and to get my work done that I have to constantly be neutral. So that is the reason why I will never get into politics, but I will always uh, be... Uh, you know, fascinated by politics. But Karnataka <laughs> has elections, many states have elections, next year the big parliamentary elections. Any last message to conclude with when it comes to people making an informed choice in who they vote for and making sure they go and vote? They have a lot of young voters out here, uh, eligible so, voters in the room. <laughs> so for me, with, uh, with my mission again of the environment, social impact, I work a lot with refugees, I work with the United Nations Refugee Agency, I work with the WHO. The thing is that, to be honest, and this may sound very redundant, but I really do not care who gets elected. As long as somebody gets democratically elected, and whoever that person is who gets democrati democratically elected, I will work with them and I will serve them. But people need to go out there and vote for sure. No, that is 100% sure. A democracy cannot work. I mean, I've got my personal preferences, but I'm not going to talk about that. But. Everybody has got their personal preferences and you need to vote on that personal preference. That's extremely important because the democracy can only work if every single person plays their part. Now, as I said, all of us need to empower ourselves to believe that we matter. Not just when it comes to the elections, but also, as I said, when it comes to individual action. Because the biggest problem that we have is that we always believe that I'm too small. But we are not. 
all of us matter and we need to empower ourselves to believe that we matter. Whatever changes we make within our lives matter. The vote that we have, the single vote that we are given absolutely matters and that can change a government and that can make this world a better place. So please, whoever can, whenever you are eligible, go vote. But I think we are going to end the note here. So far, I was sort of very, uh, you know, the one comforting thing was that I was sitting and doing this conversation with Ricky. But now I do have to stand next to him. So, <laughs> which is always uh, not an easy thing for uh, somebody as tall as Ricky. But thank you so much, all of you, for, you know, let's welcome. <laughs>